without further ado, I want to uh, talk about what we're um, uh, going to look at today. And that's, I can capture and publish videos on Google Glass and share them with some social media. But my concern as a business person is, how do I share them with my employees? How do I make a catalog of those videos? How do I, in the future, if my employees and partners have a device like Glass, Glass itself or other devices, how do I get them to uh, create dynamic multimedia video content on the fly with no hardly any training at all and share it up and publish it to a server? My goal in my work is to make sharing video content as easy as sending an email. So I should be able to, instead of writing out an email, um, or talking to one person on the phone or even 10 people in a single conference call, I should be able to go to my factory floor and diagnose a problem with the line and send that video up. I should be able to, if I was a veterinarian, um, train my employees on how to properly care for the animals and so forth. So that's what we're going to uh, do a use case right now. And it's a little forward thinking because not many of us have glass, but hopefully it's coming soon. And I wanted to give you some of the concepts of um, uh, how video is changing. In my view, video is not, doesn't always have to be hyper-produced with expensive cameras. I got two of them here looking at me. Uh, you can just do point of view um, information. So I'm uh, Scott Lawrence Lawson. I use my middle name because there's Scott Lawson's all over the place, so that distinguishes me on the internet. I'm the director of IT architecture at QAD. QAD is a software company. We're about 35 years old. We make ERP, or Enterprise Resource Planning Software, and supply chain software for manufacturers. Boring. Okay, so basically some of our customers are like Avon, the people who make shifters that go in Fords, uh, medical device suppliers, uh, people who make jewelry, people who make food. My favorite one of our customers is Foster's uh, Beer in Australia. So <laughs> that's a fun one when we get samples. And here's uh, how to find me over here on Google+, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So what we're going to cover today is we're going to look at a little bit of trends of con consumer tech and wearable technology, look at video growth, and, and um, just see what that really means. I'm going to share an interesting uh, bit of research uh, about a mobile timeline, looking into the future of mobile. And then we'll get down to the nitty gritty and look at the capabilities of Google Glass, look at some specs, uh, and look at the tools used and the workflow that I've used in um, uh, setting this scenario up. And then we'll look at the technical setup of those tools. If you really wanted to do this yourself, uh, I've lined it out in the slides for you. And um, look at the best practices for capturing this kind of content and kind of discuss some use cases and then Q&A at the end. So um, hopefully we'll fit that all in. Now, consumer tech in the enterprise is no big surprise. It started a really long time ago with PCs. We might think PCs are not consumer tech anymore, but at one time, I'm old enough to, to remember that they were. In the 90s, uh, they came in with the spreadsheets, and we had Lotus 1, 2, 3, and, and uh, specialized programs to uh, design flyers or, or make uh, brochures or whatever, and those were all run on PCs. And I can remember very clearly working with a huge company that mainframe was of the day, green screen was of the day. They're very suspicious of these crazy PCs, which will compromise our security, and they're not going to be good for anything. Um, but uh, obviously, we know how that turned out. Another little bit, thumb drives, right? Uh, anybody have a thumb drive here? Probably everybody, right? <laughs> you can go into anywhere, plug it in any computer, and take all the data you want. And at one point, everybody was freaking out about it, and some very big companies might disallow them, but pretty much we don't worry about them anymore. Another piece of consumer tech are uh, printers, right? You had the administrative assistant who had to do the, the specialized calendars, or maybe you have the marketing people, and they needed a special color printer, and they didn't want to connect to the big uh, old Xerox printer that was you know, uh, poor quality down the hall or whatever. They would bring personal printers into the office and connect them up. I remember one of my jobs was going around and trying to hook them up and download printer drivers, making sure they worked with all of the uh, corporate PCs, the Macintosh, is another example of consumer tech in the enterprise. 
games. We know about the gamification of uh, uh, the corporate life. You know, you're going to take a class or whatever, and they make things into various games. Well, those obviously came from consumer tech. Mobile phones and smartphones. Um, many of you probably got into business, and maybe you didn't even have a mobile phone, but when you got one, what, what was on it? Uh, pretty much nothing. There was maybe texting. You can make a phone call, and maybe you could play one of those games, uh, you know, or something like that. And it really didn't do very much. And you had to think about, well, that doesn't do much, but it was useful in some sort of way. And I relate glass to that. A lot of people ask me, how do you like it? How's it work? And I'm like, well, you got to get used to it. It's a different paradigm, just like a mobile phone and a smartphone is a different paradigm. Um, another kind of consumer tech in the enterprise is web applications. So a lot of people you might use Dropbox. They're like, oh, I just put my files up there. Uh, WebEx was another uh, perfect example. WebEx was not a corporate tool. It was a, a sort of guerrilla tool that came in. You know, goddamn IT people that can't get anything straight, we'll just use WebEx. And you know, they made sales. And uh, it worked for business, and it's here to stay. And now it's a huge company. So a lot of web applications are, are like that. And then, of course, why not Google Glass? And it's my view that Google Glass and things like it uh, will wearable computers or wearable devices will make their way into the enterprise. And it uh, behooves us today to take a look at them and understand how we can apply that technology, even though at first it seems like kind of a gadget. Hey, I can get the weather, you know, big deal. Uh, I can get that on my phone too, but we have to think about it. And we'll show some use cases for wearable technology. And you can see these pictures of wearable technology from many ages. And you might go, well, those aren't technology, those are tools. Well, what's the difference? A tape measure extended mankind's reach from three feet. We used to measure things by our arms and yards and from the nose and your thumb was an inch and all that kind of stuff, depending on how big you were, to a real tape measure. And people wear them today, uh, every day for their job. Sony Walkman is another example of wearable technology. It was revolutionary in, the, in, the, in its day. The wristwatch or the pocket watch is one of the oldest wearable technologies. Hearing aids and even um, things to see in the dark. And you know, I have a uh, holstered gun here. This is wearable technology. Uh, whatever you feel about it, in some day and age, it extended a person's reach into the community to do something you couldn't do, to assist you. And Google Glass does the same thing. It assists me when I might forget my appointment. It pops up. It assists me to know that um, recently uh, we had a, a, a dramatic event at LAX, you might have remembered, and my daughters were flying out of LAX. So it was very assistive to me to go onto Twitter, uh, look at uh, their airline and get the tweets and the updates from uh, LAX and the airline while I was uh, cruising around. Now we're going to look at some of the work trends in the enterprise that uh, will uh, hopefully convince you also that wearable technology is going somewhere. 80% of the companies now have mobile workers, and mobile workers are um, all, all different places. So you see that uh, person who comes around and checks your your uh, gas meter, right? Um, that person has a piece of technology in their hand uh, to check your gas meter and so forth. I'm a mobile worker. I have worked out of my house as a telecommuter for 22 years. And uh, how do these uh, technologies help me get closer with all of my um, colleagues? And Google Glass is no exception because not everything is behind a desk. In here, maybe these, uh, these uh, event coordinators, they're mobile workers, and they could walk around. They have a lot of wearable technology themselves, but what if they could show somebody what's wrong with all these wires or how to switch this box down here uh, with a quick, uh, quick video or a quick photo? Regular telecommuting has grown by almost 80% uh, in the last seven years, and that doesn't include people who are self-employed. So 80%, that's like huge. Lots and lots of people telecommute. Does anybody who in here telecommutes occasionally? Like most of the people, right? Uh, every once in a while, it's a Starbucks business model. Also, in the US alone, 183 million users watched 37 billion videos online. Um, uh, and that comes from um, the COM score from 2013, COM matrix, uh, video matrix. 
And yeah, that's consumer videos. That's fun dog videos or you know crazy uh, uh, humor videos or whatever. But this is mirrored in the enterprise. And to give you some proof here, I went on to salesforce.com. This comes from a 2011 blog from Salesforce. Uh, showing a chart of Salesforce videos, videos posted on Salesforce.com. Now, who on Saturday, when you had a lot of fun, wanted to go to Salesforce.com and watch a ha-ha video? Nobody, right? These are all business videos about selling things or whatever. And you can see that uh, in February 09, there were almost nothing, and it just rockets up all the way to February 11. The blue is the videos watched, and the red line is the videos produced. So um, somewhere around, uh, somewhere north of 2,000 videos uh, produced in February 2011. I'm sure if you looked at this now, I couldn't find a more current chart than this, this would be uh, equally exponential. Now in my own company, QAD, I produce a chart from uh, last year. So this isn't equal to Salesforce uh, chart because that was two years growth. So these both started zero, assuming that you know whatever we had then we just started zero, and it's a it's a long slow slog up this mountain here. But our company had 60,000 views last year, just north of that, and 620 approximately um, authors, uh, you know. Uh, videos authored, and these are more formal. Now you might think, oh wow, you have a big company. Our company is less than 1,500 people, and probably, well, as you can see, 620, that's uh, not very many, not a big percentage. So um, we've been doing uh, online video internal uh, for quite a long time, and most of these are kind of short videos. But I can see if I could enable other people to make videos quicker, because here you have to go to your computer, you have to run a software, you blah, blah, blah. You can't take the camera out, it costs money. We only have three recorders, two of them are fixed, one of them is mobile, but mobile is like this friggin' big and you gotta lug it around. Um, uh, you know, uh, if we could um, uh, produce these videos, um, I think that it could be a real boon to our uh, company. If you want to come in and sit down, that's, uh, feel free. Now here's an interesting quote from our friends at Streaming Media Magazine. Thought I'd give a plug to the, uh, <laughs> to the folks who put on this fine conference. And this is James Careless in the State of Enterprise Video 2013. This is in, the, I think, the March-February uh, issue, February-March issue, quoting David Boyle, Director of Digital Media at Oracle. And you can read that, I'm not gonna read it to you, but the, the key points is video is the ideal form of communication. He's talking about enterprise video. And the ease of doing that means that enterprise video is the preferred option. So he's saying this now. So to me, if you can get some technology, whether it's Google Glass or it's small cameras or whatever, that you can uh, distribute to your employees and they can easily make video and have that auto magically published. We don't have to have the magic video people in the background pulling the strings or whatever. If they can put it up on the server and send it out to people, this I think can increase productivity uh, because that's how people understand the world now. They understand it as video. We, uh, Vine has taught us that, Twitter videos have taught us that, um, is that you know people don't read. I mean, that is about as much as I wanna read myself uh, for work. So now, the last little bit I'll, I'll talk about is this mobile timeline. And I'm not gonna go through every single little dot here, but uh, what this shows us, there's gonna be three slides here starting in 2012, and it shows that Google demos Project Glass. So in 2012, we got uh, Google Glass, and uh, it's been building in uh, 2013. And right about 2013, another mobile technology, uh, innovative technology is Microsoft Connects, you know, that uh, uh, movement kind of thing, where in the enterprise, people are using these uh, tools. It moves um, up to 2014. We think Google Glass will be available to the public in 2014, and almost everyone, uh, will have a smartphone. In fact, in Africa, they've skipped the whole phone in your house phase that we had. They just went from nothing to phones. And now smartphones uh, are becoming ubiquitous. We move a little forward, we get wearable technology, whether it's the Fitbit or the wristband or the whatever, 
um, and it becomes from a hobby, from geeky uh, people like myself, to somebody saying, oh yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll wear that, just like the wristwatch, right? Um, video conferencing, uh, maybe a year after, uh, they predict, Infotech predicts that will become just like in-person meetings and affordable to everybody. You know, Cisco Telepresence says that today, but you have to have a billion dollars to implement it and a couple hundred people to keep it going. Um, give it a couple years, everything shrinks and, and uh, gets better. They predict in 2017 that printing <laughs> and 2D kind of uh, information will become a thing of the past because screens are all around us. This is a screen in my eyeball, right? Uh, I can see it. And um, screens and uh, smart walls and uh, wrappable displays will become more and more prevalent. Go a little bit further and they talk about follow me storage. You know, right now, my Google Glass follows me around. It goes, hey, you got an appointment. Hey, you got that. What's going on? You should do that. Oh, you know what? Twitter said this. Oh, your wife's calling you. Whatever. It kind of follows me around. And I can uh, take my storage with me, not as a USB drive, but um, in the cloud. And so when that actually becomes real for most people and the Internet of Things connects people together and connects things together and connects people to things like the Nest thermostat or, or whatever, um, pretty soon they, they predict that, that technology will begin to fade away as technology for average people. They call it average people. Not people who come to a conference like this and see geeky cameras in the, in the expo, but for average people, your grandmother, your uh, person down the street, whatever, your kids and, and grandkids and whatever will grow up with the stuff. They'll like, Grandpa, did they, what is that thing, you know, or whatever, that old cell phone that you have in the, in the drawer or whatever. And you'll say, well, I only could use this in California or it cost me a million dollars. Really? Wow, that's weird. Um, and, you know, here they uh, really predict out that seven or eight years from now, uh, technology will be here and it'll be you. You're the center of uh, your own universe. So I think that's interesting research. It's certainly predictive and science fiction and whatever, but uh, I think folks like us can um, certainly think about it and make it happen. So now, let's get into what is Google Glass. Well, we've seen it. We saw the little thing. If I do my head up, I'm not having a seizure. It actually turns it on and uh, I can uh, see the time and I can say things or whatever. So it's basically a little wearable computer that connects to the internet via your mobile phone. It delivers information via screen and sound. The screen looks like uh, a, uh, uh, from eight feet away, it looks like a 36 inch screen, uh, pretty much like a TV to my eye. And uh, you can certainly afterwards, if you're interested, put it on and, and check it out. And it's always ready, it captures images and voice, put input and it's always ready. So this is the new paradigm that you have to think about when you get Google Glass is that it's different. A lot of people think, well, it's like the Go helmet you wear on your head or whatever. It's not really. It's supposed to be off. So most of the time it's off. And it has to be that way because the technology inside can't have a big battery. It can't be heavy because you're not going to wear something that heavy on your head and uh, carry it around. So it's something that is not for reading the internet. Like you cannot read a web page on it. You can, it does that. There is a way to read the, uh, the, the uh, web page on there, but it's not very good. It's, you can't type on it. You have to be able to talk. So here's another paradigm shift. We have to know how to talk to computers. Anybody use uh, voice recognition technology to write emails or letters or whatever? And, you know, how is that? Does it work perfectly every time? Not quite. <laughs> Not quite. I always want to, you know, send something from Glass to Twitter and say hashtag something. It doesn't understand that. <laughs> now, one would think it would understand that, but it still doesn't understand that. And uh, I always crack up about Google Voice, you know, that technology that listens to your voicemail and sends you an email and transcribes it. Anybody have that uh, turned on? It's pretty humorous. Uh, I have this guy who, who's a, a vendor, and he has a very thick French accent. And all of the times, his messages are so funny. They're almost like uh, you know those autocorrect things. But I'm like, what are you saying? You're insulting me or something. Um, so it's those kind of paradigm issues that we have to deal with, right? I mean, we might watch Star Trek, and they say, computer, and it all works or whatever. But uh, we have to get used to it. So Google Glass is just that. Here's the technical spec. 
screen and uh, make one point. And that is, this is not a super powerful computer. It's only got 682 megabytes of RAM. Now, you know, you might think that's amazing if you're an old guy like me, but you know, your phone has more than that. Uh, you can pack a lot more stuff in here. It's a five megapixel camera, lame up. So if you're trying to compare Google Glass to a mobile phone, uh, it doesn't really compare, but it's not supposed to. It's another device, it's a different kind of device that is paired with your phone. Maybe one day they'll put everything in the glass that, that is on your phone, but I doubt it. I mean, there's no keyboard here, and you know, uh, eventually, or sometimes you need a keyboard. Some of the cool things that it has, and I'll show you this uh, as uh, sort of a, a demo. Make sure this thing is uh, turned on. Press the wrong button here. Um, is the accelerometer is kind of cool. And this is an Easter egg. You may have heard about this or, or not. I'm not sure. Let's see, here it is. Um, if I go into uh, this license screen, give it a little bit of time to, to load up here. Um, what it has is a, um, a picture, essentially, of the Google Glass team, and you can meet the team. And so when I go up here and meet this team, I'll come down here to, to, to download this. Um, it's going to show me a photo, and the gyroscope and the accelerometer will show me. This is a photo sphere. You know what a photo sphere is? It's a 360 photo. So when I walk around and I look, the photo will change. Now it's changing slower on there, but it's uh, much uh, more smooth. I can look at the ground, I can look at the ceiling, and I can walk all the way around uh, this uh, large group of people. And you can create these photospheres on your uh, phone today. And that guy in the blue shirt, I'll stop for a moment, uh, is uh, surging um, right there. So the technology there has, it has a lot of technology in it that's interesting but it's uh, specifically applicable to glass. How you hear is this bone conduction transducer, so it doesn't have an earphone, it has a little thing that sends those uh, sound waves through your head, uh, through your bones, and uh, that's probably the worst thing about glass. It's very hard to hear on glass, and the next version of it, which should be coming out this month or next, is gonna have earphones, uh, earplugs, so that you can hear it. Um, that also the next version, they say, is going to be able to connect to uh, glasses. And you can see I'm super geeky because I have glasses and Google Glass on, which uh, was really my only option because I'm not so good with contacts. So what can it do? I've already talked a little bit about these, but I put up some apps on here. Um, it can do personal stuff, social stuff, news and information, publishing, and commerce, and you can read some of those apps here. This is a subset of the apps, but these are all the ones that actually work well. There's uh, a bunch of apps that you know says that they can do, but it doesn't really work very well. But um, I will uh, show you that over here on the glassware, as I was saying when we were first coming on, this is a list of all the glassware that's official, and this golf site by SkyDroid right here, this is this one right over here, um, and this, um, it's the Lista and this cycling app and this running app and this word lens app, those are all brand new today. So people are making apps and Google is putting them into the app store uh, at a very rapid rate. One of my favorites here, and I can't really show you because uh, I don't have time, but it's this field trip. This is a very useful one where it knows where you are, and so it tells you interesting stuff about what's around. Oh, there's an old castle over there. Go check it out. And you can go oh, get directions, and you can walk over there. And I used it in Seattle to learn all kinds of stuff about old churches and people and battles and stuff that you would have never, uh, never thought of. Um, OK, so that's kind of what it does. Uh, out of the box, as it were, these are all um, apps. I kind of like Kitch Me, too. You can get recipes online, and then it tells you how to make food. Uh, as you're chopping that stuff up and your hands are all messy. It also can do other things. And uh, some of the, the neat things are medical. Um, this guy did a full uh, complex surgery through glass on some guy on his knee and, uh, and streamed it in real time via Google Plus Hangouts to 150 doctors around the world. Um, so they can see exactly what he sees. So that's pretty cool. Now the can is out of the box. 
mobility. There's uh, a lady, Alex, who uh, was paralyzed, and she basically got class, and then she was able to go out with her friends and experience the world, take photos herself, um, talk to it, post online, and experience that. And the thing that I'm going to show you is really push videos to employees, and we're going to learn about that right now. So here's our workflow. Capture the video and audio in class. Send it to this thing called full screen beam, which you heard me uh, talk about uh, or say when uh, I started. What that thing does is it pushes your video to YouTube. And YouTube processes and publishes the video, and it can be any YouTube account. Um, the M thing there is from Miro, it's an open source RSS video reader. So I have that running on an FTP server, and it basically pulls YouTube goes looks for new videos on me and downloads them from video automatically, like whenever I want. And then it stores them there. And then at our work, we use MediaSite, which is a, a video um, cataloging tool, which publishes it to employees. And MediaSite allows me to wrap security and metadata and tags and a catalog uh, around that. And you know, most of these are modular. And we just found out that uh, if this then that, has a, has a glassware, so maybe full screen beam is an optional component. Maybe you don't have to push it to YouTube. Maybe you can send it right to FTP, um, uh, whatever. So this is just what uh, we'll, we'll show you. And so here's the tools uh, that I just talked about. But I did other considerations. If this then that is a nice tool. Uh, we also use Camtasia Relay, which is a video uh, conversion uh, tool. Or you can write your own glassware, is what they call software for glass, because most of this stuff is open API. YouTube is, is a good one, because that's how I use it. I go and use the YouTube API just to go get the video. And I didn't have to program it, because Miro does the magic for me. But you could program it if you wanted to. OK, so the capture workflow, you kind of saw what I did there. You first take the video in glass. And then you uh, press the button to record longer for 10 seconds. So by default, the class only records a 10 second video. So um, there's a little bit of uh, uh, fussing around with it, uh, with that. So you, you have to touch it. So a um, paralyzed person couldn't uh, record longer than 10 seconds. You shoot the video, record audio, it has very good audio. You uh, tap it twice to stop, you share it with, and the menu shows up and then it sends it to YouTube. Now, here's the part that takes a little bit of time. I did two videos this morning, uh, earlier after, before lunch, one from the expo and one from outside, and did this. And I'm hoping they would show up, but I haven't seen them yet. So I don't know if it's the network or if it's YouTube or whatever. So uh, a direct route would be definitely preferable if you were going to, you know, if immediacy was the, was the um, ticket. Um, and then once it's sucked out of YouTube by Miro, um, it downloads that MP4 to the FTP file, and then MediaSite has a feature that it just pulls FTP every 15 minutes and um, so forth. And the last step is the human step is in MediaSite, and this is just an aspect that you could probably solve with some programming. Um, it gives you this big the FTP machine name of your darn video. Because if you notice, I had no way to really title it, right? <laughs> I have no typing. But um, MediaSite as a tool makes that easy, and I'm, I suspect other tools would make it easy as well. Um, and that can be farmed out to the individual it's, uh, themselves. So the workflow timing, when I, when I was testing this week, um, I, the quickest I ever got a video from uh, I shot it to it was available to employees was about 40 minutes. Um, the normal is about hour and 15, and today uh, the demo gods were not were angry with me, so uh, I'm not sure if they're there. We'll go look at them at the end, see, <laughs> see if anything's there. Um, so on to the technical setup. Basically, you have to install this full screen beam on glass. So all glass apps are is basically you have to have glass, and when you get glass, you get this website called My Glass, and you go on to there, and, th and there it is. And um, you just basically uh, either turn them on if they're in here, or if they're not, you go to the vendor's website and you click, and it authorizes your glass with this application. And then you basically have the thing on. Now on YouTube, you need to set up a public account. So for me, for this demo, I'm just using my 
public account. I don't, I'm not a big YouTuber, so it doesn't really matter. It's not clogging up my stream. But obviously, you can get any kind of YouTube account, but they have to be the same account as Glass. So if you were going to do this, it's a personal thing, right? And that's the point of uh, the modern world, is that your device is your device, too, and um, your content is your content, and you own it. When you take a video with a video camera, it's like, uh, OK, I'm taking your video, and I'm the cameraman or whatever, but who? Who owns that? In the new world, in really this world where your data is going to follow you around and you're personally um, uh, connected to and invested in your data, uh, it's going to be your account. So uh, Full Screen Beam has an option to post it as public, so you need to do that at this point to use this solution. And then you use this API string. So in the Miro app, uh, I just configure this string, which I got from uh, YouTube. And uh, if you're interested to find out where the reference is, I can give that to you. That big, long, nasty-looking phrase there is my username from YouTube. And you can get your username from YouTube um, uh, right over here when you go to your uh, settings. And uh, you go to advanced over here. So this is your YouTube user ID. You can use your full name and so forth, but it's not quite as accurate and so forth. You also have a channel ID, so you could use this to get all of the YouTube channels. Or technically, you could use this to get somebody else's videos. So that name there doesn't have to be me, that user slash is me. You could say users slash um, the onion or whatever and go get those videos if you wanted to pull those into your corporate. Uh, uh, type. And then Miro happens to want an uh, RSS feed, so that's that last parameter is the feed type. Okay, and uh, let's see. In Miro, um, this is the open source tool. And after this, after I give this talk uh, on my blog, I'm going to post these slides and I'll post some other uh, links and information as well. Um, and you can uh, go and get that information there. But basically, you need to set up the source. That's what that YouTube API is. Then you have to set it to a folder, Miro to a folder, to say, go to this folder. When you pull this stuff off of uh, YouTube, pull it into a folder and um, go download anything. So whenever I do a video, I don't have to go back here and do anything. It just says, OK, I'm going to auto download new. There's a little teeny blue button at the very bottom that, that tells me that. And then um, basically, you choose some uh, uh, podcast settings um, so that it doesn't delete them or it doesn't get rid of them before MediaSite can get to them. So that's that timing piece. And then uh, in MediaSite, the last piece is that you say, if you were using MediaSite, you say, look at that same folder. And go get anything that's new in there. Import that job and import it into a specific template in a player and make all that stuff available as a folder. So MediaSite does that magic on the back end and so forth. And you know, again, it's not commercial for them. That's just what we use at uh, our, uh, our work. So um, let's go back over there. Let's see kind of what that looks like. Let's see if I've got anything. If I go over to my YouTube um, and uh, go back here, look at my channel. The last channel I did, yeah, was this morning. So that's just a bummer. Um, so what that would look like is, uh, let me go to my bottom, let me go to my end of my slides here real quick and go to this catalog, I don't have that up in my browser. So how this would look like in the uh, corporate world would be a catalog like this. You would give somebody on your internet a URL or whatever, and um, this would be a catalog. And you can see the big, long, nasty names in there, okay? And you can see some of um, my prior videos or, or whatever. I did this 48-second uh, Rose video uh, for me and so forth. It's just playing this little window. I can pop it out here. But it's telling me, oh, you know, uh, saying, oh, here's how you prune a rose. And um, this is my, my uh, I should say, my perspective there. This morning I did one before I drove up here. Let's pop this thing up. Um, I guess you can't hear this, and that's OK. So I have a 
tankless water heater, so I was pretending I was a plumber and um, I'm talking about, hey, here's how you install the tankless water heater. And this is my view, essentially. So I'm going down here and, and I have audio with this and I'm talking about these you know, fittings and so forth. And you can imagine that, you know, depending on your business or whatever you're doing, you can just say, um, you know, hey, go up here, look in here. You can, you know, you can't zoom in, right? <laughs> you can move your head to zoom in. Um, and I'm telling them this is a gas thing, and you can see my little area on there, and uh, these are the flush valves, and blah, blah, blah. And so I'm talking about this, and it's a, uh, you know, a minute 17 or whatever. And then that's on your corporate uh, library. And depending on how you set this up, um, you can uh, have that um, go to a particular folder or not. So I can go and, um, uh, I think I can go and edit this real quick. This is uh, part of the uh, part of the media science suite of uh, features. And as an employee, if I did this, I could change this name to uh, Tankless Water Heater Setup or something like that, and then just save that. So then that'll uh, look better in my uh, catalog. Okay. So let's uh, pop back over to the slide. I mean, that's really the whole the whole deal. Again, um, to go back to uh, my diagram here. Basically, after a video, send to YouTube, suck it out of YouTube, put it on the FTP, have media sites suck it up into uh, its system. Now, there's some best practices though with video. And that is, when you're taking a video, you need to explain it to people how to use it, and if you're taking a video of people. Because there's a lot of suspicion around glass. I've um, only been in public once where one person was really suspicious about it, and I was asking the people around, oh, can I take your picture? And he was like, oh. <laughs> Most people are kind of just intrigued by it, and it's cool. But you do have to be nice about it if you get one. Um, it sees things from your point of view, not the camera's point of view. It sees things from your point of view. So when I take a picture, it sees the whole room. I can't zoom in on this gentleman in the front row. I can't, I can't zoom in on that. I'd have to walk to him and see. And you might have seen when I took the picture, it lit up. My, my uh, screen lights up. So it's not, a, it's not a secretive device, but it sees things from your point of view. If you're going to take a video, keep it short, under three minutes, I suggest. Um, the glass does heat up a little bit, taking all that video and maybe they'll fix that in the future, but uh, it also burns up your battery. So you can only really record uh, 45 minutes of uh, video if you're doing a lot of video. Um, you have, need to carefully press this button to extend because if you don't shake it around, it gets kind of crazy. Um, and you have to do it all in one take. And this is one thing that I always uh, run up against in employees, uh, even without class, is they're like, sit down and do a presentation and they want to edit it afterwards. I'm like, no, you're on television. <laughs> think about the news. Just think up what you're going to say and say it. Um, you don't get a second take when you're in a meeting explaining something, so you shouldn't get one here. Um, and then uh, speak a title or an intro. Be ready for it, uh, because you don't want to waste up the time um, there. And you can upload later. So yeah, I can take a video right now, and I can upload it later, and that would just uh, reduce immediacy. So, some of the video you cases that I can see, and this is my last slide before the, the Q&A, mm -hmm. is you can do employee interviews. Let's say a new employee came to your company, and you could, uh, from HR, you could say, hey, we want to say howdy. Can you say howdy to all the, the, the uh, employees out there? Tell us a little bit about yourself. That can be done very easily, no IT involvement. Um, you do the thing, it uploads, and there you have a video portal, and by the end of the day, the new person feels included. You can do office tours. You're opening a new office. You could show employees coming to a training center, what it looks like, how to get there. Um, you could capture issues for analysis. So you could go down and say, well, look, see, the problem with this table is we need to fix it or whatever. You don't have to get a camera and try to get that put there around. Um, and do process documentation. Let's say we're going to set up this room. OK, well, I want the chairs like this. Instead of giving them a piece of paper with little symbols, you can actually show them the real deal. And then, um, in conjunction with Google Plus events, 
you could have uh, kind of a fun event and um, that particular tool uploads pictures from uh, different people who are uh, attending the event and you could um, do some uh, do some commenting in a stream and, and things like that. So uh, it might be uh, fun to to use it in that way. And I'm sure there are other ones in business, but I think my uh, point is relatively clear, is we're trying to lower the barriers to video production uh, down to the point that anyone can do it. You can just take a device, stick it on your head, okay glass, record a video, okay, here's my wonderful and attentive class at Streaming Media West, and I thank them all for their attendance, and we'll let them ask questions. Okay, class, share with full screen B. And it's shared. And maybe an hour later, cross your fingers, <laughs> maybe half an hour, it'll be up there. Uh, there. So, let's uh, hear those questions, and I'll try to give some answers. No questions. I stunned you. <laughs> cool. Uh, very good. And if you want to come up and ask uh, individual questions, that's fine or play with it. Uh, I'm happy to, to let you do that. And uh, have a great rest of your afternoon.